today, which is meant to be a public holiday here in Melbourne, I actually booked some work in and then the guy cancelled this morning and I had someone else coming in. So I thought I'd do something I've been putting off for several years. Let's put a clutch in the 400. Um, feels a bit like a holiday today. I've got my uh, home work boots on. Instead of my work work boots, so it feels a bit like a holiday anyway. Okay, first thing to do when doing a wet clutch on one of these is drain the engine oil out. I'm going to keep the oil, so it's got a, an ice cream container to put it in, which is about the best container I find for collecting and reusing oil. I'm going to pull this plug out because it's the easiest one to get to. There will still be oil in this cover when it comes off, but if we drain most of it out of the, out of the bottom, I usually replace the washers when I do this. Possibly don't need to, but I don't like to reuse LA washers. Mm. That's more than enough oil out of it. <clears throat> I thought I had all the tools out on the bench I needed. I forgot to about tightening this up. So, 43 newton meters. Yeah. It's a bit neater and easier than doing the uh, sump plug sometimes. Okay, so now we crack all the cover screws. Oil pressure switch. Now this one being an early wet clutch engine, the clutch slave cylinder is in there. Up to 1997, with the end of the 600SS and 750SS carby models, um, the clutch slave was in here, and that's from the start of the Panthers. The 98 on engines have the clutch slave cylinder on the left hand side of the engine as the bolt on part, the same as the big blocks. So the clutch internally is a little bit different to the later wet clutches. And hopefully the cover comes up easy. I'm going to start. When I take these screws out, I tend to start at a point I know and just line them up so that when I go to put them back in later, I know the order they came out in. Now there will still be oil in there, so we'll get a tray to catch it, and I'll move the good oil out of the way. To try and get these covers off, this one hopefully has a gasket, um, but all the later model covers are gooped on with the 1215 3 bond, and the best way to get them to come loose is just to tap them with a soft hammer. You can hear it, there you go. The ones that are gooped on often take much, much more prolonged tapping than that to the point where you start hitting it pretty hard in frustration. You just got to control yourself. Now because the slave's in here, I'm not going to 
pull the hose off because I can't be bothered bleeding the clutch again. So I'll hang it out of the way. That's a slave there. If we pull a clutch lever in, you might see it move. Like that. I've got a where we can keep this up here out of the way without damaging anything. Okay. And so the gasket, there's a gasket on here. It's broken in a spot, but the best thing about the gasket is it just comes off. Even if it's stuck on there and you've got to scrape a little bit, it's so much easier than dealing with goop. The goop really annoys me when it comes to this sort of job. Good for sealing, not so good for cleanup. Now, the clutch on these, because the slave cylinder is in the cover, pushes in instead of being pushed out, like all the, all the other late model ones do when the slave cylinder is on the other side of the engine. So, the way this one works is that all those little screws pull up the pressure plate at the back and it gets pulled up. This is the clutch spring plate, holds the springs in, it's got the bearing in the middle and the piston and the slave just pushes on that. These are the six springs. I'm hoping when it goes back together that I can leave two of these out to reduce the clutch load a little bit. I would expect they're the same springs as the 600 users and uh, being a 400 it should be able to get away with four of the springs as a 600 would use. There's an O-ring here, which is where the oil from the oil pump here, oil pump pushes oil into the filter, it comes out of the crankcases, it comes out this hole into this hole on the side cover, through the clutch cover, primary drive cover, into this hole here, which is the end of the crankshaft. And then the oil goes into the crankshaft, up through to, through to the big end bearings, and some of it goes through to the other side and lubricates the inside of the starter clutch mechanism. So don't forget that O-ring when you go back together. I always replace them. Um, so now the pressure plate is free and you can see the, the clutch pack moving in and out. And what it's retained by is this steel ring here. In some way, the steel ring ends. There we are. So, steel ring just pops out, like that, big steel ring, and that's what holds the clutch pack in. It's amazing what a little steel ring can do sometimes. And this should come out together, ah, here's the clutch pack. And that, you can see the pressure plate now at the back pulls out and loads the clutch. Wet clutches don't usually wear out. They, uh, they tend to go off as much as anything. So the pack thickness on a wet clutch usually isn't a problem, like it, it often is on a dry clutch, um, simply because the wet clutch hasn't worn, it's gone off. And in this instance, the clutch in this, it takes up right at the end of the lever travel. Um, 
it isn't such a big issue, but it drags. It's very, it's almost impossible to get neutral on this bike when it's stationary, even with the lever pulled all the way in. Um, so it means that there's a lot of clutch travel for it, but it's not releasing. And that's often what you find with wet clutches. They don't wear out as much as they, they start dragging or doing other things that are just really annoying. Um, there's a particular MV F4 750 engine, the SPR and the SR engines that use unique clutch packs in them. And that's what they do. It'll get to the point where the clutch will be all the way into the handlebars and the bike will just crawl along. And the only thing you can do to fix it is replace the pack. The first thing I might do is actually measure the pack thickness just out of curiosity. I'm hoping that it fits onto a dry clutch drum. I'm not sure if it does now. That makes it much, much easier to control it all when you want to check the pack, the pack thickness. I need to get a steel plate on first. There we go. And it is 35.1 millimeters. I'm not sure what these packs are meant to be. Often the pack thickness, particularly on a on a uh, one of these wet clutches, is a bit irrelevant unless it's really worn. It will unload the springs, and the springs won't have as much load on them when it's assembled, and that might lead to your clutch slipping, or if it's too big. If you push this too far back, the pressure plate can fall off the back of the hub and wobble around. So you don't want to have the pack too thick that the pressure plate goes all the way back. So that's one thing to be aware of. Um, I'll take the, the steel plates, which are a little bit blue in places. The pack I've got is just friction plates only. So I'll take these and I'll um, give, them, give them a wash. Then I'll bead blast them to just take the shine off them and then uh, put it back together. The new clutch pack is a Nufren F1567 OR, which means frictions only. Um, I haven't really used Nufrens before, but um, I found this somewhere once and I thought, oh, why not? I'll give it a whirl. So this one has one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight and a half. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and a half. The half I'm referring to is the outer plate, which in one of these is steel on one side, which goes up against the, uh, the big steel ring. And that inside side is friction. So I'll give those a quick wash, make sure there's nothing contaminate on them. Then I'm going to drop these into the oil I drained out of it because you usually soak wet clutch plates in oil before you fit them. So I'll do that to get these soaking. I'll give the steel plates a wash and a bead blast. And then I'll come back and put them in. Okay, so now I'm back. I've uh, bead blasted the steel clutch plates, which just takes the shine off them. Um, I guess on a surface finish level, it would make it a little bit more, a little bit more abrasive. Um, but that's just what I usually do if I'm reusing clutch plates. Um, the clutch pack itself is about 0.7 of a millimetre thicker than the pack that was in it. Um, it's a little bit thicker, which will push the pressure plate back a little bit, which will preload our springs a bit more. Now in terms of the clutch springs, when I... Um, I have got a 600 engine in bits, so I thought I'd get the 600 engine springs out and check them. As it turns out, they're a different spring. The springs in the 400, visually much the same, but the wire diameter on this spring is 2.5 mil. On this spring, it's 2.7. Now, the, the wire thickness makes quite a difference to spring rate, and that extra 0.2 millimeter wire diameter actually makes this spring about 40% stiffer than this spring. And I remember years ago we did a clutch replacement on a 600 Monster at Moto and I think Dan did it and the owner asked if we could make the clutch softer and I said well we could try running four springs instead of six. Dan put it together, went out for a ride and found that the clutch slipped. So he came back and put the original springs back in it so it had six springs. 
So I know that four springs of these 600 springs isn't enough for a 600. And these 400 springs are about 40% softer than a 600 spring. I did a calculation. If you had six 400 springs, that's about the same spring rate as four 600 springs. <laughs> the four 600 springs are about 6% less or something. Um, so I might try it just for the sake of it, see if it does take the edge off it a little bit. Um, but it's a bit of a moot point to some extent. What's interesting is that the, the 400 spring appears to be the same spring that was used in a lot of uh, the 900 dry clutches and some of the four valves. Um, so it's quite strange when you think that a, a spring that works in a 400 wet clutch is the same spring that works in a 900 or 1000 dry clutch. It's pretty funny. Uh, one other question I know people will probably want to ask is clutch packs. Um, this is the first time I've used a non-genuine wet clutch pack in a wet clutch bike. Um, I've only ever used genuine packs, even in the, the applied torque clutches that started in the, the S2R 800s and then went into all the small blocks. Um, the applied torque have a, a ramp inside that sort of, as the clutch drives, it pulls itself together. They're made by Adler. Um, Adler do make replacement clutches for, the, for most of the Ducatis now, so the Adler clutches should be fine. Um, but I've never actually used anything but a genuine pack. Um, people, people may want to ask about Barnett's. The wet Barnett clutches I've never used. And the reason I've never used them is because the people who used to sell me Barnett dry clutches would say, don't use them in a wet clutch Ducati. Um, so I never did. Um, so no personal experience there. If someone has had a good experience with a Barnett wet clutch pack in one of these, put it in the comments. I don't mean to, to badmouth Barnett, but I just was told not to use them. So now I'm at the point of putting the clutch back together, cleaned all the old gasket off. Um, the good part about the gasket is that, particularly given that I'm going to have two springs out, is if I need to pull it apart again, the gasket comes off much, much easier than having to clean all the goop off. Having to clean goop off just drives me insane. So it's much, much better using a gasket. Okay, I've put some gloves on so I don't get my princess fingers dirty. And so we'll just put it back together. On these, the first plate in is a friction plate. It goes up against the aluminium pressure plate, but because it's all oil, it's fine. Um, these plates are steel and the clutch basket itself is steel. I think 2001 was the first time they put an aluminium basket in a wet clutch bike. Um, you'll see the cutouts in the steel plates. I usually just arrange them so they're opposite. So if I put one of the posts at the top, I'll put that plate there. The next one I put in, I'll put it as close to the bottom as I can. There. Just for a balancing, I don't know that it really matters. Um, it's one of those things that you see and you wonder if it should matter or not. I don't really know. I don't even know why they put them there. I've certainly never seen anything published that would tell you why it's there. I guess one thing I should have done before I did this is check the steel plates for flatness, which could be the reason why it's dragging. Maybe I'll do that. <clears throat> one of the reasons the clutches can drag sometimes is that the steel plates, which are meant to be flat, warp. So you put them on a machine piece of steel, like this piece of tool steel I've got, you can see it's flat. There's no, it's not lifting up at all. And if they're warped, they will usually lift up. And you'll see one side lift. They're not, so I'm happy to leave the others in there pretty much, I think, at that. Can't be bothered pulling them all out. But, yeah, there's no warpage in them at all. So I wouldn't be overly concerned about that. But certainly, if you're having a dragging issue, um, and you pull a clutch out of it, certainly worth checking to see if all the steel plates are flat. 
I've seen quite a lot of dry clutch ones where the plates are, you'll find you know, half the steel plates will be almost as warped as the, uh, the single thinner conical plate is. And uh, that leads to, to issues with when you pull the clutch in, the plates, which should just separate like that because they're warped, they're sort of like that, until so they just don't release, they're still dragging each other as if they're straight, they just separate nicely. So that's one thing to be aware of. If you've got a dragging clutch issue, probably should have paid more attention to it before I bought it about. Okay, and now the big spring clip goes in. I'd put the ends of it, try and put the ends of them so they're supported by one of the, the basket fingers. And that's the ends there. Okay, so that's in. Now the clutch comes out. And so I'll put in four springs with my possibly ill-conceived plan. And we'll see how we go. I like using the drill to put them in. It just makes it much easier. So, four springs. Get one of the screws. A little bit of oil on the threads. It's always a good idea. You can hear get smart thing in the background. This bike has done 85,000 kilometers, and I would expect the clutch that was in it is probably the original. Because they just really don't wear these wet clutches. This lasts forever. Being a six mil volt, it's ten newton meters. A little o ring, paper gasket. I like to grease the gaskets up. Uh, if you do have to pull it apart again, it usually makes them come apart nicely. Not a huge amount of grease, but just a squidge all the way around. Okay, the actual clutch cover gasket or the clutch cover gasket pattern is the same as the clutch cover or primary drive cover, you might call it, from the big blocks. So this gasket fits everything. Um, most people these days would goop them on, but I like the gaskets, as I've said. Um, there is one dowel, which is out the back here. A corresponding hole. So I usually use some pieces of 6mm threaded rod which will hold the gasket in place and also guide the cover going on. The system makes it just a little bit easier when you're putting it together. Quick wipe. It's been sitting for a while since I last cleaned it down. 
just so there's no oil across the gasket face. Okay. Now, the O-ring. Put a bit of grease on the O-ring. Okay. Pop the O-ring in. That should should just sit there. Should. Hopefully it stays there. And now I put the gasket up. Just do what you need to to make sure the gasket goes on nicely and sits where it should. Okay, we get the clutch cover. Looking at the clutch cover, this here is a seal that seals on the snout of the crank. Now, on anything pre-2001, this seal looks like it's in the wrong way. <clears throat> and it's something of a pressure relief. Uh, I believe it's, there's no other reason to fit it the wrong way around. Um, on 2001 models, they changed the oil pump drive ratio. The gear on the oil pump back here has many, many fewer teeth and the pumps spin a lot faster and they make a lot more oil pressure. And with that change, they turned the seal around. And so 2001 onwards, the seal's in what you would think is the right way. Okay, and on we go. So it was the uh, <clears throat> the piston and the clutch slave had come out. So our screws, we started with that one and we went that way. So go back around, make sure the screws and the gasket sitting nicely. Mm. And all that, I didn't make sure. But the carpet, the O-ring is still in place. I get a bit paranoid about these O-rings. Yep, it's in the right place. So, so to start all these, so uh, the gaskets Got something holding it in place all around without actually tightening it up. Pieces of threaded rod are really handy. You can even use screws with the heads cut off if need be, but it does make it much, much easier. This one's got the things for the hoses on it, but we'll put it in for the moment. Okay, and that should go on. I think it's the uh, piston just coming out. So we've got all those tight. Again, 10 newton meters.
So I'll leave that screw until I put the, the hose guide back out. Which I'll do on a tick. Okay, they're all fine. Now the first thing you do once you've got it back together is pull the clutch in and see what happens. feels about normal. I did this to a 900 SS once that uh, had a very worn clutch pack in it <laughs> and when I pulled the lever it pumped the piston out and then it went bang as the piston blew out of the, the slave cylinder on the left hand side. It turned out the push rod because the bearing and the pressure plate had seized it had been spinning the push rod and it had worn the push rod so short that with a new clutch pack and the pressure plate moved out it uh, was all too short. Made a hell of a noise. It scared the shit out of me. Let's pop it in gear. And what I'll try doing is just turning the back wheel. That certainly seems to work. So that's a good start. Now I popped the belt covers off earlier. You probably noticed they disappeared at some point. I put the belt covers back on. And I'll put the hoses back down and across. And then I'll put the oil back in it. And then we can go for a ride. So, I've got the clutch in the 400, been for a ride. Um, might be a little bit lighter, it's really nice to use at the lever. Uh, still hard to find neutral, although now it feels more like a a detent not wanting to select neutral more than a it felt like it hasn't got the, the load on the lever that it used to have but so I don't know how much I really achieved but it does certainly take up a bit nicer in terms I just thought to explain what a 400 SS is for those who might not know uh, it's a Japanese model but uh, it's got an official compliance plate on it Australian compliance plate NF Import has brought 20 of them into Australia in 1993. Not really sure why. Uh, it is a unique VIN number sequence, so it would have been a uh, homologation expense, I would have thought. Not really sure why they would have done it. But <clears throat> it's basically the same bike as a 93 model 750 SS, but with a 400 engine. Um, and it's kind of funny if you think about Japanese things, it'd be like a, a Yamaha FZR 750 with a FZR 400 engine. The Japanese just wouldn't do that. The, the FZR 400 would be a completely unique bike to an FZR 750 in every way. The frame would be smaller, everything. Whereas this is just a, a 750 with a 400 engine, which is, which is what Ducati did. <clears throat> and realistically, it's just, it's compared to a 900 SS, it's got one less disc and a skinnier back wheel and less than half the capacity. <laughs> but apart from that, it's the same thing. This one I bought on eBay that was cheap. Uh, and like all cheap Ducatis, it turned out to be a nightmare. The tank is rusted out and it was all pretty rough. Every panel, I think, except the front one had been previously repainted badly and so I bought it in a fit of stupidity one night and then regretted it <laughs> as I do with lots of purchases. Uh, the 400 engine went to the Monster for a few years uh, now it's back in this. Everything basically has been redone on it. I had the frame powder coated 
and I was going to go with a colour that was called Champagne Gold, I think. But when I got to the powder coaters and looked at their colour charts, I picked this colour instead, um, and it's wrong. I think the Champagne Gold colour that I was going to go for would have been much better. Uh, the wheels are black as they would be in 93. The bodywork I had painted silver like an FE. I had cut graphics make some special decals. So they're black outline with gold. Originally on the red bikes, they'd be a gold outline with silver. So I thought it was something a bit unique. Uh, the seat base I got from Rudy at Duck Only in Holland, I think. Um, it was something he had kicking around. I was buying some bits off him and he threw that in pretty cheap. Uh, it's a bit different. I think it's a German manufacturer. It's lower than a super light and sort of less roundy. And the Mega Cycle Muffler from Ken. That's one of the mufflers that was on Mini Monster. Um, I had a the muffler that was on here was some weird thing. And I took the entry pipe out of it because it was the same size as this one. Slipped it on, painted it up, got muffler polished. Got a bracket water jet cut uh, to mount it, and that's about it. Had all the nuts and bolts, redone gold, shocks built, uh, forks have been resprung. I'm not sure what it's worth, but I'm sure I've spent about twice that. And it's fun to ride, but I don't really want it. <laughs> so I uh, have to try and extract myself from, from another bike I didn't really want but I probably shouldn't have bought, but it is fun.